Alright, so um, we're going to start shifting gears now to the... So this is technically in Chapter 4, um, but uh, it's really part of the next chapter. So we've pretty much finished the um, applications of the derivative, and now we're going to move on to integration. So um, we're going to go through um, integration, and then in Calc 2, you'll just keep going with integration. And integration is probably the most important thing um, in the class. Um, and we'll talk about it when we get closer to uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. But uh, like when you take uh, physics, um, the formulas that you see in physics, for example, um, are derived using the ideas that we'll see uh, in um, this chapter when we're talking about integration. Um, and it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and so kind of one of the basic sort of building blocks is the um, antiderivative, which is exactly what it sounds like. So you know how when we have a function, we know how to get its derivative, right? We already know how to do that. So then the antiderivative is just going backwards. So we, I guess in a sense, intuitively know how to find it. But in, in reality, it's actually um, quite a bit uh, difficult, much more difficult than just getting the derivative uh, because you'll, we'll see that we don't really have um, just uh, um, rules that kind of work. You know, like when you get a derivative, you can pretty much, uh, you see it and you're like, oh yeah, I know what to do. I need to use the chain rule or, oh, I need to use the product rule or whatever. Uh, but antiderivatives, it's a little bit uh, less um, obvious what to do. Um, okay, so let's start off with... Um, definition here um, so uh, we say that uh, we'll just say capital F of X is an anti derivative of little f of X if capital F prime of X equals to little f of X. Okay. So let's do some, some just simple examples. Um, so uh, find, let's say find the antiderivative uh, capital F of X of the following functions. Okay, so let's say, for example, we have uh, the function, we'll start off easy, two. All right, well, so the antiderivative um, is the function whose derivative is two. What is it? Two x, yep, good, all right. Do another one. How about um, zero? Three, four, five, any constant, right? And when you get the derivative of any constant, it's always equal to zero. So I'll just say C, where C is uh, any constant. Okay, sounds good. All right, so so far so good, pretty easy, right? All right, now what about, uh, let's say we have, for example, x squared. So what's the function whose derivative is x squared? A little bit more challenging, right? So it doesn't come out off right, right away. Um, but, I mean, basically we're thinking a little bit like the power rule, just backwards, right? So, because uh, x squared is a power function, right? So if you're gonna get the derivative of some function and end up with x squared, what's probably, it's probably gonna be some kind of x cubed, right? Because you get the derivative of it, it, the degree goes down by one. But it's not quite x cubed, right? Because if I, for example, uh, test here. So what's my test? Well, I would need to get the derivative of 
x cubed in this case is 3x squared. So not quite, right? So what would it be? How it's it's almost there, but not quite. One, one yeah, one third x cubed, right? So one third x cubed works because then when you get the derivative of one third x cubed, what do you do with the one third since it's a constant? Yeah, you just leave it out, right? So then this would be one third times 3x squared, which is just x squared. And now you're good, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so um, so we actually, um, well, maybe let's do one more and then we can write down a, a power rule for antiderivatives. Uh, let's see, how about x to the fourth? Can you guys see what that would have to be? The antiderivative of x to the fourth? x to the fifth and then divided by five, right? So if you, if you don't know, if you're not sure, well, just test, right? You can always test. Um, all you have to do is get the derivative. So does that work? If I get the derivative of x to the fifth over five, I end up with x to the fifth, which is exactly what I was, oh, sorry, x, sorry, sorry. I don't know where I got five from. Fourth, right? Which is exactly what I was looking for, right? Okay, so, um, all right, now, uh, before we write down just kind of a, well, no, we can write down, okay. So uh, let's write down a power rule for antiderivatives. Okay, so if if I have um, so if my function is x to any power, right? So n is any power. Um, well, greater than zero, obviously, right? And greater than zero. Um, then uh, the antiderivative of that, in general, what would that be? X to the, not quite n, and plus one, right? So notice how it's pretty much the same as the power rule, just backwards, right? Instead of bringing the number down and then subtracting one, you add one to the exponent and then divide by it, right? So it's pretty much the, the opposite. Um, okay, now this is not, so all of these, well, almost all of them, are actually not 100% uh, correct um, because uh, notice here that, so like for example, this one, how many antiderivatives does uh, the function zero have? Infinitely many, right? Because it, it could be, the antiderivative can be any constant, we said, right? Okay, so that's because the derivative of a constant is always equal to zero, right? Okay, so like let's say, for example, this first antiderivative. What if I um, added the number three to that? Would that still be an antiderivative? What if I added 30? What about 300? What about 3004? Sure, right? So how many antiderivatives does the number two actually have? It also actually has infinitely many antiderivatives, right? Okay, so the, the general antiderivative is actually, you say, so whatever it is, right? The function plus C, where C is any constant. So all these antiderivatives are, should actually be plus C plus C because when you get the derivative of that you the constant is, the derivative of the constant is zero does that make sense so um, you also might see this called the you might call this the uh, general general antiderivative okay so then this one the power rule this would be plus some constant C right Okay, so this is our first antiderivative rule. 
All right, so any questions so far? We're pretty good? Um, why is, oh, sorry, no, it's not greater than zero. Thank you. I don't know why I wrote that. There's one number that n uh, cannot be. Um, no. It actually can't be uh, negative one. Um, okay, why don't we, let's open up a new sheet. Okay, why can it not equal to minus one? So if I, right, it, so, well, yeah, so if my function is x to the minus 1, and I say, well, the antiderivative is add 1 and divide by it, right? Add 1, you get 0. Well, that's not quite right, right? Um, but it might help. Well, hold on, let me do this. Okay, so this is undefined, right? Undefined, okay. But what is this um, equal to? This is 1 over x, right? So what's the function whose derivative is 1 over x? Yeah, ln of x. It's actually ln of the absolute value of x. Um, and we'll see this a little bit later. Why? absolute value we will see later okay so um, so we have the power rule right and then we know how to find the antiderivative of x to the minus 1 or 1 over x uh, what would it be for example so like let's say for example I have um, uh, I don't know square root of x what would be the antiderivative Yeah, it's just using the power rule, right? So um, this is x to the 1 half, right? So then the antiderivative would be, so 1 half, you add 1, right? So 3 halves. OK, now instead of dividing by 3 halves, it makes much more sense to, d to multiply by the reciprocal, which would be 2 thirds and then plus. See? Does that make sense? Okay, so all that is just using the power rule so far, right? Um, so what about, for example, um, let's say you have the following. Uh, let's say you have x squared minus 4x plus 1 all divided by square root of x. And you want to know what's the antiderivative. Well, do we have a uh, quotient rule for antiderivatives? Up to this point, at least. No, right? I mean, we've seen the power rule. That's it. Um, well, um, turns out there is not a quotient rule for antiderivatives. But can you think of a way to rewrite that so that we can use what we know? Uh, that's one way, sure. What's another way? So you can move the square root of x up, right, as x to the minus 1 half and distribute it, right? So you can do this. What would be, can it, did anybody think of a different way to do it? So like that, right? And then distribute, which is fine. This works. 
because this would give you, what would that be, x to the What do you do with the exponents? Add them. So 2 minus 2 plus negative a half. So that's 3 halves, right? Okay. Minus 4x to the 1 half and then plus x to the minus 1 half. Now notice at this point, did I get the antiderivative yet? No. I'm just rewriting it so that I can use the power rule, right? So here, this is still the function, right? Um, the antiderivative. The antiderivative would be, so what, what's the antiderivative of the first term? x to the 5 halves, yep. Yeah, times 2 fifths, right? So 2 fifths x to the 5 halves. And then what else? Well, typically, since they're, we're adding three functions, we'll just put the plus c at the very end, just to make it easier on us. So what else? What about the second function? So minus 4x to the 3 halves, right, times 2 over 3, right? So that's going to be 8 thirds, sure. And then plus x to the one half and then times two over one, right? And then don't forget at the very end, plus c, yep. So do you guys agree that if we get the derivative of capital F of x, that we'll get little f? We do, right? Just by using the power rule. Um, so, uh, so we won't do it, but just in case you were interested, um, you can also rewrite, you can also break it up like this. So you can rewrite this as x squared over root x minus 4x over root x plus 1 over root x, right? And then if you simplify that, what would you get? Well, you basically get that, right? And then you get the antiderivative. So the same thing. It's just two di slightly different ways to uh, approach uh, the problem. In the end, you end up with the same thing. Okay, so questions? Questions, questions? So far, we're doing okay? All right, so what do we have? We have the power rule, right? Um, we have the, uh, the antiderivative of 1 over x. Um, one thing that we notice, so take a look at this. So see how we were able to work out that one? Um, but let's say you uh, were trying to find the antiderivative of the following. So what is the antiderivative of, for example, um, Let's just keep it simple here. X plus 1 over, I don't know, X minus 1, for example. What is the antiderivative of that function? Well, notice, um, so for example, if I had this, if I didn't have that minus 1, I would be able to do exactly what I just did, right, in the previous problem. But because I have this minus 1 here, um, can I simplify that in any meaningful way? Not really, right? I mean, you can break it up if you want. You can say, okay, well, this is x over x minus 1 plus 1 over x minus 1. You can do that, but does that allow you to simplify it like we were able to the previous problem? <coughs> no. Um, notice, can I use the power rule on any of this? Also, no. So if you just kind of start thinking in your head, you're like, okay, well, what's a function that when I get its derivative, uh, I get this, for example, just that one alone, that first one. What is it? Uh, sure. You can kind of think of 
uh, the antiderivative of each one. So something like that maybe, right? But is that going to end up giving you... So notice the derivative of the individual functions is there, right? Like the, the derivative of the derivative of x squared over 2 is x, and the derivative of ln of x minus 1 is 1 over x minus 1, right? That's true. But if I get the derivative of this function, what rule would I have to use? Product rule. Would I end up with x over x minus 1? Definitely not, right? So, I mean, you can try. So let me remove all these scribbles that I made. So you can try, and if I say, okay, well, the derivative of this is 2x over 2 ln of x minus 1 plus x squared over 2 times 1 over x minus 1. Well, I have everything that I need, except that I have all a whole bunch of extra stuff that I don't need, right? So where else can you go from here, really? You can't really go anywhere, right? So this is what makes finding antiderivatives so difficult, is that something that looks so simple that it looks like you should be able to just say, oh, it's just that. Uh, you can't because of the way the, the backwardness of, the, uh, of what you're trying to actually find, right? Because this is a quotient, anything you come up with probably has some sort of quotientness in it, which means when you get it, the, its derivative, you're going to have to use the quotient rule, which just messes up the whole thing, right? So you get all kinds of extra stuff. Um, so at least to start with, um, the number of functions that we can actually get the antiderivative of is, is pretty limited, you know? Um, so we have like the one we just saw where you know, this looks bad, but because there's only one term in the denominator, we're able to break it up, right? If I, for example, say, okay, we'll just add a one here, this all of a sudden becomes an impossible problem for us. Does that make sense? Um, the good news is because so many problems are impossible, then the number of problems that you can actually do is less, which means that it's easier to narrow down, you know, what you, what you need to learn. So that's, that's on the plus side. Right? You got it. What is it? What's the saying? Uh, look on the bright side, you know, or whatever it is. You know, there's like a saying. What is the saying I'm looking for? Like, um, I don't know. Okay. Nah. Um, okay. So, okay. So this is sadness. We actually don't know how to find that. And it, it doesn't even look that like it should be that hard, right? I mean, look at it. It looks so simple, right? It looks like it should be no, no problems. Um, what about this one, just for fun? Can you guys think of a way to do that one? That one you probably could figure out. So what did you say? Ln of x minus 1. Yep. Right? And that works, right? Just for that one little piece. Um, there actually is something you can do, just since we're on the topic, and it, eh, maybe it, it's a good review. What is x divided by x minus 1 equal to? Can you guys think of another way to write that? Uh, yes, but that doesn't allow you to um, break it up. But what if you actually divide them? If you actually divide x by x minus 1? You guys remember how to do that, right? You guys remember how to do that? Shouldn't be that bad, right? What would I put down right here? One, right? X divided by X is one. Then you multiply, you get X minus one, right? And then what do you do? Subtract, right? 
So you subtract. So this is going to be a plus, right? So you end up with plus 1 is your remainder, right? So what does that mean? That means that this is equal to 1. What else? Plus. Actually, let me use the same coloring. So this is 1. This is the quotient, right? Plus 1 over x minus 1, right? And then can you get the antiderivative? You can, right? So this we can get the antiderivative, right? This would be x plus ln of x minus 1, right? So it actually turns out that we can find the antiderivative of this one. So what did we just do? We turned the frown upside So what is the antiderivative in the end of that? So the antiderivative of, well, I guess it's not equal to, right? So the antiderivative let's see. So the antiderivative of the whole thing would be, so the antiderivative of, of this in the red, right? Which we found was this guy, x plus ln of x minus 1, and then plus the antiderivative of this guy in the black, which was what? ln of x minus 1. Uh, and then don't forget your plus c, right? So then in the end, what is this? This is x plus 2 ln of x minus 1 plus c. All right, so we got a little lucky there. We were able to actually find it. Okay, so questions. Okay, so if you forgot how to do long division, you guys can review. Because you're going to need to know it anyway for uh, this and that here and there. Uh, but already you can start to see that it's not as straightforward as finding derivatives, right? So, uh, you know, the power rule is pretty standard, but then we had the other one, the one we just did up back here. Uh, this one we had to just kind of change the way it looks to do stuff. And then this one, we're like, well, I don't know. The whole, th all is lost. But then it turns out if you divide it, well, then it, hey, you can actually find it, you know? Uh, so it's, it's. And that's just kind of how it is. You know, it's just with practice, you get better at recognizing, but, um, but it takes longer because it's not as straightforward. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So let's do some more stuff here. So um, how about some, some trig functions? So... Um, so what are the antiderivatives of the following? I might as well make a table. Should be good. Okay. So f of x, uh, and then the antiderivative, which we typically call capital F of X. Okay, uh, so let's see. How about start off with our old old pal, sine of X. What's the antiderivative of sine of X? Minus cosine X, right? So notice it's, it's backwards, right? Why? Because, well, if when you get the derivative of minus cosine, well, the derivative of cosine is minus sine, right? So then you need the extra negative to make it positive. Okay, so then what's the antiderivative of cosine x? Positive sine x, right? Okay, good. Um, what about tangent? Tangent. 
Well, it's not secant squared x. Because if you test, what's the derivative of secant squared x? 2 secant x times secant x tan x. How close is that to tan x? Not even in the same ballpark. Not even close. Not even close. Okay, so that didn't work. <laughs> okay, so what is it? What do you guys think? Any ideas? Good, you have the right answer. We don't know. There is one, but we don't even, we don't know close to what we need to know to be able to figure it out. So we don't know and we can't know yet. Uh, we will know eventually, maybe in a couple weeks. Um, but there is one that we know, so how about let's do it backwards. What would be the function whose antiderivative is tangent x? So the other way around. So we know we would, so we can find the antiderivative of secant squared x, which is tangent x. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's better than nothing, right? But notice. Uh, what's the antiderivative of secant x? Now probably you guys will figure it out quicker this time. We don't know. That's exactly right. <laughs> we don't know. This one's even worse than tangent. But yeah, we don't know because we don't. So if you think about all the trig functions, you know the derivative of none of them have a derivative of secant. You know the derivative of secant x is secant x times tangent x, but none of them who's just secant x, right? Uh, so okay, well then let's do that then. What's the antiderivative of secant x times tangent x? Yep. Secant x. Good. Uh, let's see. All right. What else can we put on, on our um, list here? How about cos? What's the antiderivative of cosecant squared x? Negative cotangent, Negative cotangent x. That's right. What's the antiderivative of? cosecant x cotangent of x. Uh, close, almost. Almost, what's missing? Negative cosecant, right? So it's the same, uh, notice it's very similar to secant x and cosecant x is similar, just the signs are uh, opposite. Uh, let's see. All right. Well, we've got a lot of space here. Might as well fill it out. Let's make another, another column here. Okay. f of x. Antiderivative. Okay. Um, how about one over x squared plus one? What's the antiderivative of that? In, that's inverse tangent, right? So inverse tangent plus c. Uh, let's see. What about one over the square root of one minus x squared? 
That's the antiderivative of that. Inverse sine. What about 1 over the absolute value of x times square root of x squared minus 1? Inverse secant. Uh, let's see. All right. So what else? How about? Might as well fill in the the rest of the space we have. What about um, e to the x? What's the function whose derivative is e to the x? E to the x. That's right. Good job plus c, right? All right, what about a to the x? So some other, some other constant. So like, for example, 2 to the x, or 3 to the x, or 4 to the x. What do you say? We're going to have an, L of a, an a to the x for sure. Close, because remember the derivative of a to the x is a to the x times ln of a, right? ln of a is a constant. So then if you're getting the antiderivative, it would have to be, well, yeah, you're going to have a plus c. But you're missing something. So here, for example, you are missing an ln of a. But the question is, where is it? So like, for example, if I get the derivative of, let's just say, 2 to the x. This is 2 to the x times ln of 2, right? Well, um, I want to end up with, so I want to find the function whose uh, derivative is just 2 to the x. So what would, what would that be? How would I have to change this? You'd have to divide by ln of 2, right? So that when you get its derivative, the ln of 2's cancel out, right? So the general antiderivative is going to be a to the x divided by ln of a. Does that make sense? Because then you get the derivative, you'll get an ln of a on top, and then you want those two to cancel out, right? Okay, all right. What else? What have we not done yet? So we did the power rule. What about the antiderivative of the natural log of x? So what's the function whose derivative is ln of x? I'm going to write it in red. <laughs> we don't know. That's right. We don't know. This one, actually, you have to wait for calc 2. Okay. Uh, so it's good to know what you don't know or what you shouldn't know, right? So, like, if you don't know something, it's good to know that you shouldn't necessarily know it, right? Okay, uh, let's see. <laughs> what about, uh, what's the product rule for antiderivatives? There is none. All right, what's the quotient rule? There is none. What's the chain rule? There is none. Um, so, even though there is no product rule, um, there's a sort of product rule 
which is called integration by parts, which parts, integration by parts. Uh, let's see, integration by parts, which you learn in Calc 2. Uh, chain rule, there's a sort of chain rule, which is called integration by substitution. And then this we'll learn later. Not later today, as in later, like eh, maybe next week or something like that. Um, I'm trying to think if I forgot any. So we have the power rule. We have all that stuff. That's a lot. Um, did I forget any? Which ones? Adding them, uh, yeah, so I didn't write them down, but we kind of used it. Um, oh, back here. Uh, let's see, where is it? This one. Um, because when you get the derivative of functions, you just, and you're adding them, uh, you just get the derivative of each term individually and then just add them together, right? So it's the same with antiderivatives. When you're adding functions, just get the antiderivative of each one. Uh, it works the same as with the derivative. Um, okay. And I don't think I forgot any, but nah, that's okay. We'll, we'll see some more when we need them. Um, okay, so any questions? All right, so should you know these? Yes, but it's the same as the derivatives, right? They're just backwards is all. So it's not like you have to learn some, you know, a whole new thing. Uh, it's just the same thing that you already know. You just have to think about it a little bit differently, right? Um, okay. All right, so then uh, on a related note then, uh, let's talk about differential equations. Okay, so, um, so a differential equation is basically just an equation that has um, derivatives of functions in it. Um, so, well, let's write it down. So, a uh, differential equation is an equation with a function and um, one or more of its derivatives. Okay, now very important. The solution to a differential equation uh, is the function that satisfies the equation. Okay, so um, so you guys remember uh, in algebra, for example, if I said solve x plus four equals seven, what would you say the solution is to that? It's x equals three, right? So notice here, when you're solving uh, this kind of an equation, the solution is a number. It's the number that when you plug it in, the left side equals to the right side, basically, right? Uh, so differential equations is exactly the same idea. The difference is that you have functions and their uh, derivatives. So here, let me show you an example. And we're only gonna do very, very, very simple uh, differential equations. Um, in Calc 2, you do a little bit more complicated, but not very complicated. And then there's a whole class um, which is basically the last class after um, you can take it after Calc 2 but in, if you look at the numbers it's the very last math class you could take at community college basically um, and there you do nothing but differential equations so you get really into it um, but in the simplest sense it's just an equation and you're trying to solve it the solution is it's a function though so like for example uh, let's say you want to solve the differential equation 
equation. dy over dx uh, is equal to, oh, I don't know, uh, 4x to the fifth, let's say. Okay, so what did we just say? We said the solution is uh, the function that satisfies that equation. Well, what are you looking for? Basically, so here, this is uh, telling you that um, you're looking for, you're looking for y, basically, whose first derivative equals what? 4 x to the fifth, right? Now, this is no different than what we were just doing. It's just a different way of looking at it. Now, it's, it's just a differential equation. So, but what you do is no different than what we've just done, right? Basically, uh, if you're looking for the function whose derivative is 4 x to the fifth, another way of saying that would be you're looking for the antiderivative of 4 x to the fifth, right? Which would be what? So this is the solution. So what is it? 4x to the 6th divided by over 6 plus c, right? Or 2 thirds x to the 6th plus c? Okay, so do you guys agree that if I plug in this function into this equation that the left side will equal to the right side? Yes or no? You with me or no, without me? So this is my solution right here. Two thirds x to the six plus c. Yes. Okay. Can I can I plug that into the original equation? Sure you can, right? Right. So it would be dy over dx, right? So basically, you take y, right? What do you do with it? Well, you get its derivative, right? So on the, on the left side, you would have dy over dx. What's the derivative of 2 thirds x to the 6th plus c? Is it not 12 thirds x to the 5th? Okay. Does that equal to 4x to the 5th? Sure it does, right? So see, see how it's just, it's the same thing we've been doing. It's just a worded a little bit differently. Yes? Here, let's do another example. Oh, and here, um, this, let me, uh, where is it? Uh, right here. Uh, this right here, this is called the general solution general solution of the differential equation. equation. <laughs> general because it has, it's plus C plus any constant. Um, but let's say for example, you wanna solve uh, dy over dx uh, is equal to four x plus uh, two, let's say, um, where y of zero equals to one, for example. Okay, so here notice we have a, an extra uh, condition. So we're looking for the function whose derivative is four x plus two, but also y of zero should equal to one. So when we plug in zero, we should get exactly the number one back. Does that make sense? To the function, yeah. to the, yeah. And you'll see where you use that. So basically this right here, you're gonna use to find the constant C. Basically is, is what it tells you. So um, instead of having infinitely many uh, solutions, you're gonna have just one. It's the one 
uh, that satisfies y of 0 equals 1 in this case. Does that make sense? Okay, so, all right, so what would this be? What would y equal to? 2x squared, yep, plus, plus 2x, plus c, right? Okay, so that's where we start. So do you guys agree that that function, if you get its derivative, the left side would equal to the right side? Sure, right? Okay, now um, you can use this now to find what the constant c is. So now let's uh, plug in y of 0 equals to 1. So basically you plug in 0 for x, right? And 1 you plug it in for y. And that allows you to solve for c, right? So if I do that, so I'm going to have 1 is 2 times 0 squared plus 2 times 0 plus c. So what is c equal to? 1. Okay. So then I end up with y is equal to 2, 2x squared plus 2x plus 1. And this is called the particular solution. To the differential equation. So it's the one that corresponds to uh, that condition right there, that y of 0 equals 1. Does that make sense? So that, do you guys see the difference? So what is it about uh, uh, the constant c? What is it doing there? Well, um, if you have the c there, that's called the general antiderivative, or in the context of differential equations, it would be the general solution of the differential equation. Um, and it's there because you, you basically don't have enough information to find that constant. But if you do have information, for example, one of the big things that you can do with differential equations is model the population of whatever stuff, you know, frogs or rabbits or whatever it is. Um, and um, so depending on what uh, population you start off with, uh, then that would give you a starting point so that then you can apply your model. Uh, but if you just want a general model and you don't know what your population is, or if you want to apply it in different uh, scenarios, well then you have the general solution, and then once you find out that in information, then you can just plug it in and, and figure out, um, you know, make the model work. Does that make sense, the difference between the two cases where you have the plus C and then uh, where you don't have the plus C? So one's the general solution, the other one's just a particular solution for one particular uh, situation. Yeah? Um, any questions about, about that? Does that make sense? Um, okay, so with antiderivatives, um, the main thing is we want to get good at evaluating antiderivatives because we're gonna use it over and over again throughout uh, the next chapter. Um, But uh, we have all the rules, right, that we know so far, at least. We have this table that we made, um, and then we have the power rule. And, um, and it's just a matter of kind of putting those uh, together. Yeah? Sound good? Okay. So any questions? Yeah? You guys want to take a break? Take a break and then we'll shift gears. <laughs>